On to chapter 5. Our objectives for this chapter. Define the term hybrid construction. 2. Explain how the building error can affect firefighters. 3. List typical building use categories. 4. Delineate how reading building types can affect size up considerations. And 5. Understand how building size can be an important factor in reading a building. In this chapter, we're going to look at three categories. First being thinking beyond the five types. And that's referring to the different five types of building construction that we covered in chapter four uh, as related to NFPA. Next, we're going to look briefly at what is a hybrid building. And then really the main focus in this chapter is classifying buildings by ear use, type, and size. And that's what your review exercise is going to be about using these pictures at the end of the exercise. As stated in chapter four, there are buildings that combine the multiple NFPA types in a single building. And there are buildings that don't really fall into any of the classic five types from our firefighting perspective. When that happens, we're going to use the term hybrid to label these buildings. So with that being said, to truly get a good read on a building, the officer must further classify a building not only by the type of building, but by what era it was constructed in, its occupancy, and of course the size of the building. And reason being, you can look at varying case studies and disasters throughout history where firefighters have lost lives. And it's basically been to renovation and changes in these structures and not accurately identifying what type it is. So we need to move beyond pigeonholing these structures into types one through five and really get a good idea of what they are what they're used for and the potential fire load in those structures. And that's kind of what we're going to go through in this chapter. So things to think about as we move forward. Each of the five building types has numerous subcategories. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Two, there are buildings that combine multiple NFPA building types. And of course, in the past, you would have buildings that were uh, combined structures, like say you have a residential structure attached to a business or bakery. And that structure would always have to conform to the highest standard. But that has since changed with the addition of <clears throat> fire rated walls, sprinkler systems, and things of that nature. So the key to classify a building is to identify the type Ear it was built, the use, and the size. Webster Dictionary defines hybrid as anything of mixed origin. Even though there is no official classification as hybrid, the term hybrid building is becoming more common in the fire service today. So in the text here, a hybrid building is going to refer to any building that combines various NFPA 220 types in one structure or a building that is constructed in a manner that, from a firefighter's view, does not really fit into any of the NFPA 220 types. So again, hybrid is either going to be a mix of the different construction types, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, or something that, well, from a firefighter view, you scratch your head. I'm really not sure what the heck to call this, and uh, we're, we're going to throw it in the hybrid category. 
And I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys, since this has happened before, when you're doing your review exercise at the end, if you're going to labor the hybrid, you need to identify why you think it is and not just because you're not sure. So when we're looking at these pictures here, both of them are examples of a hybrid construction, meaning it's mixing two types together. So when you look at the one on the left side of the screen, the, the apartment looking structure, first, this is a Colorado ski resort structure that includes a multi-level parking garage, conference center with hotel space, office, and retail space. The parking garage is built as a Type 1 monolith, which is basically, you know, that poured concrete over steel rebar that doesn't really have anything to burn. And that stacked on that is the conference center in the hotel, which is built as a Type 1 using spray-on protection for steel posts and beams. However, the office and retail space surrounding the conference center here is built as a Type 2 steel building. Individually owned condos are on the very top, and that's built as your traditional Type 5 or engineered lightweight construction. And if you look on the right side of the screen, you got a good example of that, how you've got that Type 5 wooden construction right there on the roof over your steel and beam, which would be probably a Type 2 there, uh, as those girders and beams have no insulation. Though from the street view, this could be very hard to detect because unless you're familiar with the structure or you've been in it, again, you're not going to know that this is a, a truly hybrid structure. So again, it's an important for you to know what's in your jurisdiction and do some good familiarization in pre-plans and have a good look at these buildings as they're getting built in your jurisdiction. Alternate construction methods. And we do have to kind of hit this right now. But from a firefighting perspective, these are buildings that don't fit in any of the traditional NFPA classifications combined or otherwise. Sure, the buildings may be given a classification as given an NFPA type of code for permit, but that's only for approval purposes and they really aren't built to code. So for discussion's sake, we're going to label any of the non-NFPA 220 types as alternative construction methods. And this could be something um, they use example in the text, a, a straw bale construction, which we'll go uh, more into in chapter six, or for a good example, uh, the sod homes that the pioneers uh, built. So maybe ego-friendly, biodegradable, I hate using the term tree hugger, but uh, this is kind of those cutting edge, modern day, you really don't fit into anything kind of construction. So jumping into the meat and potatoes of this chapter, classifying buildings by ear, use type, and size. So this is going beyond your traditional NFPA 220, which is a good starting point, but we need to add to it. That way, s crews that are responding to the fire can get an accurate picture of what they're dealing with and start making plans. First, we're going to look at ear, and that is the historic time period during which the structure was built and or altered. And as we'll look and go through some examples, each ear has its own set of building um, designs and techniques and products they use to construct homes and buildings. Use is basically what the building is being used for, the occupancy. And an occupancy can tell you a lot about what's in the structure in terms of fire load. You know, is it a warehouse that has lots of 
uh, product in there? Is it a residential structure? Is it an educational uh, institution? Or is it assisted living kind of place? So again, that's giving us more information on what we're possibly dealing with. And then, of course, the type, which is one of the standard five NFPA types, are that scratch-your-head hybrid. And then finally, the size. The size has a lot to do with it. And we really need to go beyond saying, uh, well, this is a type for residential structure or commercial structure. So now if we said that we had a type five modern day construction residential structure that is medium size does that paint a better picture well it would if you knew what medium size meant so we'll get into that here in a minute the construction of building is influenced by numerous factors and we said the era so the historic time period during which structure was built of course the use type and size so when we are looking at era we're going to look at all the different categories that are out there we're going to look at the pre World War one we're going to look at pre World War II, and then we're going to go shifting gears into more of the legacy that we're probably more familiar with, and then of course our engineered, lightweight, or often termed modern construction. So when you talk about pre-World War I construction, you're looking at from a time period from the 1700s up to World War I. These buildings are considered tough, and if they're still around, that's a testament to how well they were built in terms of toughness. And basically, this is due to their mass, okay? You had iron, um, you had some steel, and you had high mass materials for walls and solid mass beams to support the roofs and floors. Often, they were multiple levels as well as having large open area spaces. Since these buildings had a lot of mass to them, they were able to absorb a lot of heat. So it gave firefighters, of course, plenty of time to go in, do a knockdown, and do some aggressive interior firefighting. If these buildings were going to collapse, they would always give off warning signs. And I say always, but now we know that nothing is 100%. But uh, that's more of the exception than the rule. So when you started looking at these structures from the outside, you would start seeing sagging roofs, floors, or cracks. There would be some reported sign that these things are fixing to go. So it gave you a good indicator of, hey, you know what, maybe we really don't need to be in here fighting fire, or you know, maybe it's time to get out. One of the biggest issues with these structures, of course, was the fire spread. Entire blocks, towns, and cities have been destroyed by fire. Uh, if you look at you know major conflagrations throughout history, and that's just due to the fact that once these things really got rolling, there was a tremendous fire load, a tremendous release of heat and energy, and of course in that day and age, everything was closely spaced together, so these wooden buildings uh, would just you know, catch on and kind of roll on down the block and now you have plenty of parking on the street. Other things in the mass <clears throat> that made them have fire spread issues, it had numerous interconnected combustible voids, of course the bloom frame construction, and interior geometry of the open hallways and stairs and of course the combustible material with the flammable finishes so it allowed the fire to spread and chase the air and of course as more of the product got consumed the fuel that is uh, the greater intensity the fires had to grow 
Another interesting thing in terms of fire spread was ventilation issues. And when you look at the ventilation issues, and a key thing to point out in this era of construction is you looked at the doors, and not only the exterior doors, but the interior doors had a transom. And a transom is the beam above a door used to support some sort of glass, usually ornamental in nature. And that was used to help spread light. Or it could have a louver where you could kind of turn and open the door up and would allow air to circulate back and forth. So just shutting a door in these time structures aren't good enough to help control the flow path because that glass is going to give way long before the door and wood itself would. Of course, the eternal en enemy of every structure is gravity. And, of course, gravity is going to work on the wood beams and masonry structures. And if there's no fire cut beams in there, it's going to cause these low-bearing walls to collapse quickly. Also, the cast iron columns out front were decorative extremely heavy, but they become very brittle when subjected to heat. Other problems with the pre-war one construction is the mortar that was used to hold the brick together, and it was water soluble, meaning you hit it with a straight stream or just even the normal rain over time is going to cause that mortar, that uh, binding agent to deteriorate and go away, thus making it easier for the bricks to course to collapse. Uh, this was the, the mainstay, this water soluble mortar mixture until the Portland cement came out, which was more water resistant, and that was patented in England in 1824, and in 1872 began to be used on an increasing scale in the United States. Another big hidden fact with this air construction is modernization. They've been altered because when you're looking at that particular ear, you can definitely assume that uh, you know electrical work, HVAC, plumbing, things of that uh, nature has been renovated and changed to uh, be uh, shall we say, have more modern conveniences. So that in a nutshell can cause compromises to the structure. And of course, aging and time is uh, another big one. As these buildings get older, of course, things dry out. Um, things become less flexible and, of course, begin to break down. And if you look at these older style homes, a lot of times the hardwood, uh, the, the sap, that creosol will start soaking out of them and just from getting hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. And that in itself can be one heck of a fuel load. Okay, so to recap. Your pre-World War I buildings can generally be characterized by solid mass beams or large rough cut lumber for floors and roofs and high mass material for walls. It will have open hallways and stairwells. The next year is going to be that pre-World War II, which is known as the Industrial ear and this is going to be from say pre World War II which is your post World War One to about 1939 During this era, you had plenty of growth in the United States. You had, you know, automobiles, airplanes, advances in the industrial age. So they needed larger buildings. So the need for larger buildings led to wood, stone, and brick being replaced with concrete block, reinforced for concrete, and alloyed strengthened steel as the primary building material as opposed to the iron. Of course, wood was and still is the material of choice for uh, most residential properties during this time period. Of course, this era 
had two primary factors that affected the buildings being constructed. And that's the introducing of a more standardized building code. Not saying that they weren't there, but it just came more unified. And of course, the engineering advancements really helped out tremendously. And the engineers were really more focused on reliability and you know structural integrity as a mainstay, especially when focusing in with the codes. Two of the biggest issues that firefighters faced when dealing with fires in these potential um, structures was fire spread and the collapse potential, and that was due to the fact of the building size and the use of steel, that cold steel that was very sturdy, but once exposed to fire and heat, would lose its integrity relatively quickly. So not only the steel being an issue, because these buildings were getting so massive, especially in your warehouses and whatnot, you had the steel beams running across these open areas, you had tremendous fire load underneath, and of course when they were exposed to fire, it would heat and lead to collapse. Other issues you had were the open stairwells and centralized hallways. And that really caused a large loss of life in some of the major fires throughout history, such as the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and, of course, Coconut Grove. A lot of these construction buildings had utility chases, and that's still kind of the mainstay today. What I mean by utility chases, it's these areas that resonate up through the building that contain your plumbing, your electrical, and your wiring, all that kind of fun stuff. And that, of course, can cause uh, a great void for fire to travel and be undetected in these concealed spaces. Also in this year, you had the bloom flame construction that was still going on. Of course, the open stairways, the central hallways, and the multi-story buildings, and we said the utilities were all good hazards. All right, so recap. Your pre-World War II buildings began to be constructed to conform to enhanced engineering and standardized building codes. As a result, these buildings became bigger and, of course, began to use steel as a replacement for iron and heavy timber. So the sheer size of these things really created an issue. You also had a number of single family dwellings to increase and they were relatively uh, cheap and inexpensive to put out. And in the text they talk about the Sears catalog or the mail order homes. They were cheap, sturdy, and quick to put up. Remember the cement had also changed in this time frame. Portland cement began to replace that salmon lawn, so that was an improvement. The next era you're going to have is the legacy era, which is post World War II, basically after 1945 to around about ooh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, give or take, uh, depending on what book you want to read. Post World War II, you had the baby boomers coming home, and they wanted to have more room, more freedom, more more stuff, and that whole materialistic can-do attitude. So, in order to keep up with this, the uh, legacy era was kind of born. So, you had a lot of construction going on, and the suburbs basically uh, took flight. So, we went from farmhouses to suburbs, you know, people were shifting from the cities uh, back out to these little communities. And with this particular legacy construction, you had varying changes in the different subcategories. So, for example, your Type 1 legacy, you had stadium, arenas, and other places, a public assembly, they grew to enormous size. Good thing though, these structures were made of, you know, concrete, steel reinforced materials, as well as having uh, contained elevators and stairwells and a lot of our modern 
uh, safety principles in terms of building codes and inspections. With these particular structures, as you can kind of see here on the picture on the left side of your screen, you had a center column that was made of concrete, and that's where all your services kind of came up through the floor, you know, uh, your plumbing, electrical, things of that nature. So that also added some degree of protection. Looking at the right side of the screen, you see a great type 2 legacy style construction. And it's important to note that in the type 2 legacy style construction, they were going totally away from masonry and brick. They were making things entirely out of steel and other materials such as that. Moving down the list, your type 3 legacy construction, that's going to be your modern day strip mall. Type 4, well, they argue in the text that, guess what, there's no real type 4 legacy construction. But again, if they were made, uh, it's somebody that had a lot of money, and it follows that same pattern of heavy timber, strip floor, roofs, and beams. So what are some of our issues with legacy construction? First being fire spread. And the problem with the fire spread, it, it's not really in terms of the construction method, because these are sound, sturdy built constructions. And, you know, we learn or we base a lot of our tactics today on these particular structures under the premise that we're going to have time to fight fire because they're built pretty tough and we can get in there and do our job. However, the problem has become the modern contents in terms of the fire load. What I mean by modern contents, we've gone away from wood and cotton natural fibers to your synthetics and plastics, which burn four times hotter than their predecessors. So it can easily overwhelm these structures when they're filled, of course, with modern day conveniences and plastics. Other issues in the legacy construction is updates in terms of technology. Looking at the older buildings, and I'm not talking about just homes, I'm talking about businesses. You've got the invention of, uh, you know, the internet, the World Wide Web, and the infrastructures in these buildings weren't really designed to support the electrical demand or, you know, the Wi-Fi, internet, and phone cables. You know, a lot of times, you know, you're looking at, you know, things that were wired to do one thing and you're looking at telephones where, oh my God, heaven forbid, uh, it's a real telephone, a landline with a rotary dial to, of course, nowadays you've got everybody talking on cell phones and trying to do things over Wi-Fi. So when you update these buildings with technology, one problem you can run into is the use of these cable trays because you're not going to really knock down a whole lot of walls to rewire them because that's going to be cost prohibitive. You're going to tack these trays along the running boards or maybe uh, you poke one hole through the wall and drag it through the other and it creates a great concealed space for fire to travel and of course the wiring itself that's going to be a plastic petroleum based so it's going to burn hot, uh, it's going to release toxins of course and cause issues that way. If there was any fault with these particular structures, uh, it was going to be the trusses, and that was mainly used in the roofs. However, these legacy trusses are different than our lightweight modern era trusses because the legacy trusses were actually screwed and nailed together. Uh, they weren't using the little glue or the gusset plates that are highly susceptible to failure once uh, heat is applied to them. Another important note is during this era, and my, my, I'm, I'm telling my age here because my parents lived in one of these style houses, you know, air conditioning was considered a luxury. So you didn't have central AC units. And when you start modernizing these structures, of course, everybody has to have central air because, you know, we want our convenience, especially if uh, you're here in Georgia in the summertime and, and you're dying of heat. You know, I can remember uh, sweating unbelievably 
growing up as a kid with the window open and a box fan in there uh, hoping for a cool breeze to come through of course you know the parents had the central not central uh one of those window units uh, that they kept in their bedroom plugged in which is also another example of how you can overload the electrical system by having these window units pull so much energy through and of course can start fires so the addition of these ac units can cause a change in the uh, dead load factor and once you start dead loading a structure it can be structurally sound you know when you add like say these a central ac units up in the attic or in the crawl space which is all well and good but once you shock the structure and what i mean by shocking the structure it catches fire or you throw a whole bunch of water on there really quickly and it's not gradual it's going to cause that shock like oh crap what's going to happen and then that can lead to your structural collapse and of course possibly uh floors falling or heat and ac units coming through the attic and landing on top of your head of course also with this particular structure age age is always a problem you know mortar tends to break down uh metals tend to rust and of course you know wood if left uncared for can begin to of course rot so let's recap again a little bit on our legacy stuff it can be considered arguably one of the most firefighter friendly structures it was built from post world war ii up to about i said you know depending on what book you want to read the 1960s to the 1980s um as a rule of thumb, anything built after 1990 is going to be considered our next topic, the engineer lightweight ear. The legacy construction also has several subcategories for the type 1, 2, 3, and 4 as well. So remember that our biggest hazard in terms of this structure was the fuel load from modernization. Of course, renovation, adding additional dead load to the structure uh, could also present a problem. And the truss systems in the roofs, even though I still say they're more dependable than today's lightweight construction with the geometry and, of course, the gusset plates. Okay, taking a step forward now to our modern day. This is that engineered lightweight error. Conventional framing techniques and full dimension lumber were replaced by trusses and lightweight construction that could be com um, comprised of wood, metal, or some combination of the both. Again, uh, the focus was on geometry and you know less mass, lightweight, which proved to be, of course, cheaper to build and quicker, but history has shown that, hey, they're going to fail faster in fire conditions. In some cases, interior firefighting time in this type of construction has been degraded so much to the point that um, a lot of places are considering it unsafe to go in to do any interior firefighting if there's no potential for loss of life when it comes to these structures. So we talked about the different ears and that's one you're going to have to label on these review exercises coming up. You're also going to have to hit the type of structure it is. And the next thing that I want you to add in there obviously is the occupancy. And occupancy is basically defined as what is the intended use or purpose of the building? And you look at NFPA 5000 and the International Building Code, uh, they differ a little bit on certain areas, and we're not going to split hairs over this one has this category and this one doesn't. So we're just going to use these 11 standard occupant uses to label our structures with. First being assembly, which is a building used for the assembly of people for civic, social, religious, recreational, food or drink, consumption, or awaiting transport. Next is going to be a business, which is a building used for office, professional, 
or service transactions, storage of records, or ambulatory health care. Next, we're going to say daycare, which is a building used for the supervised care of children with no overnight care. Educational, it's going to be a building used for educational purposes of six or more people through the 12th grade and some daycare facilities would fall into this as well. A factory, which is a building used for assembling, disassembling, fabricating, finishing, manufacturing, packaging, or repair operations that are not classified as a group H or hazard, and hazard is the next one which is a building used for manufacturing, processing, generating or storage of material that constitute a physical or health hazards in quantities in excess of allowed controlled areas. So that could be like your chemical manufacturers, pool chemical, uh, things of that nature. Next you have institutional, which is a building where people are cared for or live in a supervised environment. Example being nursing home, uh, hospitals, uh, things of that nature. Next you have mercantile, which is a building used for the display and sale of merchandise and involving in the stocking of goods that are accessible to the public. Of course, everybody should be familiar with residential, and that is a building used for sleeping purposes when not classified as a group I. Storage, building used for storage that is not classified as a hazard. And then finally, utility slash miscellaneous, which is buildings and buildings of accessory characters like a outbuilding or a shed. Uh, this is going to kind of be your, your catch-all for your subcategories. Next, we want you to still use your traditional and APA types. So remember you have type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Your type 1 is fire resistive. This construction consists of monolith, which is that poured concrete on rebar, concrete and coated steel, and protected steel type construction, like a parking garage or skyscrapers. Type 2 is your non-combustible. This construction is, of course, similar to Type 1, with the exception that the steel structure membranes are unprotected. And it can be kind of hard to uh, figure whether it's protected or not, especially from some of these pictures, if you're just you know, looking at it. So as a rule of thumb, I would always err on the side of caution. Instead of calling it a Type 1, which is better fire resistant, go ahead and call it a, a Type 2. Next, we have Type 3, which is our ordinary construction or Main Street America. This type of construction consists of exterior load-bearing walls on non-combustible materials such as concrete, block, or brick, and has the interior of the standard combustible wood components. Uh, they use the example in the text of the taxpayer type structures, you know, where you had the business downstairs and, of course, the living quarters upstairs. Type 4, your traditional heavy timber mill type construction. Remember, you have one continuous piece of wood uh, to act as a uh, support beam. You're not really going to find a whole lot of newer construction that's heavy timber, unless it's probably a church. Um, it's still considered heavy timber, but they're not really using the uh, traditional one long piece of wood. They're using a... Uh, glued together synthetic type piece. And then finally your type frame, which is, or excuse me, your type frame, your type five wood frame, which of course is the primary building components for walls, floors, and roofs, is going to be our combustible wood. And obviously the prime example of that is going to be our average residential homes. The next thing that you need to list or think about in your good size up, and again, you want to do these size ups like this over the radio. That way, incoming 
companies can have a good idea of what they're doing is going to be the size consideration. And in this text, we're going to talk about small, medium, large, big box, mega box, and high rise. Now, defining small, medium, large can be kind of difficult. So they've come up with a 246 method, which is great to help identify small, medium, and large structures. Here's a picture of something that can be considered obviously a small structure and they were equated to two stories or less, hence the two, with a basement. It's 2,000 square feet or less requires, and I think this is a big indicator right here to help dictate uh, what it is, is how many feet of hose you're going to need to reach any part of the building. And this says it requires less than 200 and you're needing only two hand lines or fewer to handle on an offensive operation. So again, two is small, two stories or less, 2,000 square, 2, square feet or less, and requires 200 feet of hose or less and two hose lines. Four is going to be medium. So that's four stories or less, or three stories, of course, with a basement, 4,000 square feet, no more than 400 feet of hose, and needing no more than four hand lines or less to handle offensive operation. Now, medium can be kind of hard, I think, sometimes. That's why I kind of go by the hose line. But again, do a good 360, do a size up best you can, and always err on the side of caution in terms of classifying it one higher if you're not sure. And then, of course, you can also base this off of your own resources in, in your jurisdiction. Um, if you're thinking you're going to need a lot of stuff, then, of course, by bumping it up to a uh, medium or a large type structure is going to elicit more of a response or get some mutual aid in there. Six equals, obviously, a large structure. So you'll have a six story or less. Taller than that is looking into the high rises. Uh, 6,000 square feet or more requires hose lengths greater than 600 feet to reach portions of the building and needs six hand lines or more to handle an offensive attack. The final three size classifications are going to be a big box, a mega box, and a high rise. And in short, when I think of big box and the text hits nail on the head, I think you're looking at your Walmart, your Costco's, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, things that also have probably sprinkler systems in it. Your mega box buildings can be defined as buildings with mammoth proportions. As a result, the definition will refer to those buildings that are significantly larger than your big box buildings. A good example of using the text would be a uh, MGM grand type structure or maybe a very large mall, uh, quite possibly like an, an anchor store or something of that nature. And then of course finally your high rise and it is basically defined as anything that is taller than 75 feet. So let's go ahead and look at some of our uh, practice size ups here. And I'm going to try to walk you through one to show you what I'm looking for here. So let's answer some of our questions. Number one, what year was this home built in? Is it going to be a legacy or probably a more of the uh, modern or lightweight construction. Uh, again, I can go either way on that. But again, kind of justify your answer. Use. Well, this obviously is a residential, looking at the garage there. Uh, what type of construction is this in terms of our old NFPA? So this would be a type what? One, two, three, four, or five. And then looking at our size, um looking here looks like we got a basement not sure if that's a full basement or not so i would say um i would go anywhere between a small and a medium probably leaning more side on the error of making it bigger than smaller than need be so 
let's say that this is a legacy residential type 5 medium construction home. And then, of course, go into your potential fire spreads and collapse issues as listed in the text. And then, of course, write them out for me. Now, keep this whole thing in mind because when you get to the end of this class and project, I want you to go out through your community and start taking photos and doing a presentation on so many different size ups using this exact format. And you know, take pictures, narrate them, or, or use a, a, a video, make it into an MP4, I, I don't care. But that's going to be your capstone project for this class. Okay, so here's some more pictures that you're going to have to do. And these can all be found in Blackboard under the week's assignment. All right, so. If you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can call me at 706-357-0162. Until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day, guys.